Well, Leo, that was an extremely uh, generous uh, introduction. Um, if my children heard it, the one part I know they would agree with is that I was a founding father since I think I was born in the 18th century. So, um, but thank you for that. And it's really a pleasure to be here at, uh, at EUI and to address you this afternoon and to be delivering uh, one of the Weber um, lectures. It's a real uh, honor for me uh, to do so. Um, I want to talk today about what I call mobility and immobility. I hope that becomes clear why I've chosen both words uh, as we go through this. But let me start by uh, mentioning the usual terms of the current immigration debate. It's familiar to all of you. Okay, so from first the, the state perspective, states see pressing upon them uh, large numbers of economic migrants and increasing uh, numbers of forced migrants. And they seek to control and manage and prevent these flows. It's a story of, of walls and of border guards, of visa restrictions, of stopping boats on the high seas and returning people to their home states. And migration control from the state perspective is very closely linked to the protection of national sovereignty and national security. And it also links to the demographic definition of the state because the view is that if people come in, they will eventually or may eventually become uh, citizens of the state. Um, refugees under this uh, perspective need protection, but it should be provided close uh, to the country from which the people came, and it is not a cause, a reason for mass migration to countries further afield. Now, you also know that that should be familiar to you, and you also know the story from the migrants and their advocates, uh, their narrative. So they see borders uh, of, as places of uh, repression where violations of due process are legion and frequent. Um, more generally, uh, they see migration and citizenship uh, policies as crafted uh, to preserve privileges of states and to keep out members of disfavored races and disfavored religions. And refugees and asylum seekers are detained, denied entry, or returned, and the global north fails dismally uh, in its responsibility to share the burden of hosting and caring for the displaced. Those are the two sort of current uh, stories that we hear uh, as, as immigration is debated. I, I want to first of all start by adding a bit of nuance to these, uh, these well-worn narratives. Um, so first, I think it's crucial to recognize that most people stay home. Uh, in a world of more than 7 billion human souls, only about 250 million currently live outside their homes and have done so for more than a year. This means that fully 96% of the world's population are living in their home states and in all likelihood will live their entire lives in the state in which they were born. Now, of course, many will travel for short periods of time as visitors, students, working people, uh, a billion crossings a year, perhaps two billion crossings of borders a year of tourists and, and other kinds of visitors and seasonal workers. Uh, but at the end of the day, home is in the nation state where it has always been for most travelers. And this, this preference to remain is not primarily a result of the difficulty of crossing international borders, although it may be difficult to do so. Actually, in my view, borders do more work keeping people in rather than keeping them out. And I don't mean in the old Soviet style of denying citizens exit visas or punishing family members of those who move. What I mean by this is that people tend to stay home because of fam of I'm um, sorry, because of family and work and community and nation, because of a sense of belonging. So borders demarcate and help construct the nations to which people feel attached. And the concept of citizenship fosters and reflects that attachment. So nations may be imagined in Benedict Anderson's famous phrase, but they exert enormous entropic force, a powerful magnetic pull. So what I'm saying is it's not the border guards on the other side that keep migration numbers low. It is the construction, the sentiment of citizenship that keeps people home. That's the first point. The second is we need to correct the view that the world is closing down migration. Now, of course, we find ourselves today facing powerful objections to migrations, to barriers going up, not coming down, to political campaigns that succeed with the slogan, build the wall. 
the reasons for the rise of populism are, are pretty well known and often described. It's a reaction to varying degrees in various states, to the forces of globalization, the race and religion of those who would enter, to economic and social anxiety about the present and the future, a sense of a loss of hope. And I don't want to take these claims on here or examine them, but what I do want to note is that the headlines have probably misled us. That while the restriction the restrictionist tide seems to be rising, it would be wrong to conclude that mobility has slowed or stopped. Rather, in what follows, I'll argue that in fact mobility continues to increase around the world, not due breaching of walls through undocumented migration, but rather as a result of state laws and policies that promote and foster mobility. I'll say more about that in a moment. The third opening point I want to make uh, is regards forced migrants, refugees. And yes, the numbers are high. They're higher than they've been at any time around the world uh, since World War II. Although we should note that for displaced people, two thirds of people displaced from their homes actually stay in their home countries. They're IDPs, internally displaced people. But the focus, uh, and the, fo the focus mainly in the headlines has been on Europe and the tragedy of the sinking boats on the Mediterranean and the Aegean. And I think it's led us to ignore the central threat uh, to the moral and to the practical legitimacy of the system of international protection for refugees. And it's that millions of displaced people around the world who have been forced out of home states now find themselves locked in countries of first asylum. So rather than the usual narrative of an, of an out of control mobility, undocumented people, forced migrants, I think in fact we see relatively low levels of mobility. And if it is growing, which I think it is, it is largely the result not of illegal migration, but as a product of intentional state policies. This is all by predicate for what will come next. Now, it's probably too much to expect that politicians and political parties and advocacy groups will get the facts and the arguments right, but my concern today really is on the academic community, particularly political scientists, legal academics, and policy thinkers. I think we, and I include myself in that category, miss much of what is going on in the world of human movement because we focus too much on states. And in what follows, I will argue for the decentering of states and adopting an analytical perspective that takes the viewpoint of the migrant into account. And a crucial part of this moving away from what I will term straight line views of human movement, uh, human movement as migration, is to begin to understand things in a more complex way in what I will refer to as mobility. And I will I'll try to work that out as we, we go through these comments here. Now, first on the, the movement of migrants. So for political scientists, legal scholars, and policy experts, conceptualization of migration usually begins with the state. States divide the globe, they assign people to states uh, and territories through the status of citizenship. And states are powerful machines, as I've just argued, in breeding loyalty and identity. As I've said, I think that's the vast reason that most people stay home is their sense of belonging to a state. States have constructed an international system in which those seeking to move need an officially issued document from the home state in the form of a passport and permission from the receiving state, like a visa, that sets the duration of stay and the rights that pertain thereto. These matters are understood to be within the discretion of states. International law has little to say about the right to migrate or limits on state decisions to grant or to deny entry. A state not in control of its borders, it is said, can hardly be deemed sovereign. So too the makeup of the state, its population, its citizenry, is a core attribute of, uh, of stateness. Okay. Sorry. Putting a primary focus uh, on states uh, has implications both for normative and descriptive scholarship, and I want to consider these uh, in turn. If one starts with states, one is likely to see border control as natural, or at least as justifiable, even if there's a agreement, disagreement on particulars of immigration policy, family versus workers, numbers of refugees, and the like. Uh, it's not only Donald Trump who says in supporting border controls, you either have a nation or you don't. Sovereignty on this account demands closure in a material, physical sense. Uh, 
Liberal and communitarian theorists likewise sign on to the state project for a variety of reasons. It demarcates a self-governing demos. Uh, it supports political entities that will promote redistributive policies and social and economic rights for citizens. And it can be seen as establishing the bonds of solidarity through which uh, thought necessary uh, for human uh, flourishing. So what I'm trying to say is that sort of mainstream uh, political theory, political science, uh, focuses when it thinks about immigration on states first. Now, of course, there's a counter, a counter tradition in political theory, one that adopts a free movement position I associate with Joseph Karens uh, and others. And human rights advocates have long assailed the sovereigntist position, positing instead freedom of movement as a fundamental human right. Now, freedom of movement can be and is often justified on a number of grounds as closely linked to the ability of an individual to choose and pursue the life one seeks to live, as, following, as also following from the common ownership of the world's land. By what right it is frequently asked do a group of people claim a piece of the earth and purport to hold it as their own and keep others out from that chunk of land. Borders on this account are little more than markers and protectors of privilege. And furthermore, the right to leave one's, the right to leave one's country is recognized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So in a world fully divided into states, how can you have a right to leave? How can a right to leave not imply, therefore, a right to enter elsewhere? So what I'm saying is the debate is put in pretty strong terms on both sides. A core attribute of sovereignty confronts a fundamental human right. It's a paradigmatic case of an irresistible force meeting an immovable object. But it seems to me that neither side paints a persuasive picture in asserting such high stakes. And here I'm still in the normative territory. I'll get to the descriptive in a moment. So I want to take this a little bit further. So for states, from the state perspective, it seems to me that until the numbers get very high, it's hard to see how migrant flows undermine a nation's self-definition in any deep sense. A nation's self-conception is produced and maintained through shared history, through its language, through schooling, through tradition, through media, through food, through sports teams, to attributes of geography, through nature, <laughs> literature, manners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's unlikely to be so fragile that persons coming to join family or work or study are a significant threat. Now, of course, newcomers you know, may well uh, influence social and cultural national understandings. We're familiar with that. We see this around the world. And those changes may make some members of the state uh, feel that the country they knew and loved is no longer the same. It's no longer theirs. But, you know, the same could be said of cultural and economic changes that are not attributable to immigration. The internet, the rise of the service economy, rap music, we don't seem to categorize these culture-changing events as a threat to state sovereignty. And furthermore, it's rarely recognized that with the dramatic exception of China for a, uh, several decades, states usually played little or no role in the vast majority of membership decisions that affect a state's population. That is, they don't uh, purport to uh, influence dramatically the decisions of citizen parents to have children, which is the primary way that people become members of a state. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting this adds up to the open borders argument on the other side, but rather that we should be skeptical of the claim that immigration decisions go to the core of state sovereignty or our nature that distinguishes them from myriad other uh, powers exercised by the state that may have a far greater or no less significance in the average citizen's life than the entry of migrants. So despite the importance of these kinds of government policies, I'm sorry, these other kinds of policies, they are not generally viewed as exempt from ethical constitutional legal scrutiny, which is the category in which most regulations of migrations are placed in, in law, in, in domestic law and in international law, as exempt from scrutiny because they go to this core idea of sovereignty. All right, that's on the, why I think the sovereignty side overstates its case for absolute discretion for states. Now, I think a similar exercise is appropriate on the freedom of movement side. Unlike many, but not all exercises of fundamental rights, unlike many exercises of fundamental rights, movements of persons to other states may impose significant impacts on other individuals and communities. Now, I've questioned whether these normal immigration flows are likely to have dramatic consequences for national self-definition, but surely immigration does have social, economic, demographic, and other effects which we're familiar with. And more importantly, it's not obvious 
What supports the designation of a right to cross borders as fundamental and of more importance than other liberties that are not so classified, such as the freedom to start and conduct a business, to join a labor union, to decide whether or not to buy health insurance, to take an American example. Because of the importance of these kinds of decisions to human flourishing, it's usually thought that government has to have some pretty good reason before they infringe uh, on those kinds uh, of freedoms. But there's no super strong presumption against regulation as there is in the open borders uh, freedom of movement idea, that there has to be a super strong presumption before someone's right to live anywhere they want in the world uh, uh, occurs. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that this adds up to the other side of the argument of plenary power, of the right of states to have uh, total discretion, but rather I am saying we should be skeptical of the claim that freedom of movement over international borders is a fundamental right or is of a nature that distinguishes it from other liberties that are regularly restricted without de demand of extraordinary justification. Okay, so what I seek here is an approach that is less state-centered but not state absence. That's what I'm suggesting, an approach that decenters the state. It would, I think, point towards norms that require some pretty good justification from the state before closing its doors to would-be entrants, but perhaps not the super strong justification for fundamental rights. So movement within and across borders can be understood as important human liberty, both with instrumental and expressive value, that may be subject to regulation only if based on legitimate meaning non-discriminatory and reasonable grounds. So, for example, immigration rules that prevent family unity may not be deemed reasonable. Those that exclude people linked to terrorist organizations probably are. So too, the desire to enter, a person's desire to enter a state not their own to watch a tennis match may not be, or I should say here, a football match, may not be viewed as vitally important, or maybe it is viewed as vitally important, I don't know. But uh, the request for admission in order to undergo a life-saving medical procedure probably cannot be rejected without the showing of an exceptionally strong government interest. Now, I think as an ethical norm, this conclusion is not gonna strike you as extraordinary. What's surprising is that as a political and legal norm, it represents a fairly dramatic movement from current understandings of international law. All right, that's on the, sorry, come out on the normative uh, side here. I now want to take this idea of decentering or uh, rethinking the state here uh, in, on, on the analytical descriptive side of theory. And what I mean by this would be to establish a frame of reference from the point of view of the mover, of the migrant, in addition to and in contrast with a state-based frame that focuses on controlling or preventing such movement. It would look not just at state policies, not just at state policies as defining the conceptual and policy space, but also at the goals and actions of migrants, the impact of their movement on home and destination states, identity formation, and modes of mobility. If we adopt this, I think we immediately notice two things. Uh, first, as I've stated earlier, most migration scholarship assumes a straight line model of migrant to settler to citizen with desettlement from a home state and resettlement elsewhere. I'm gonna indicate this with a really uh, dramatic uh, picture here. So that's the picture. The idea when we think about migration is that you leave the home state, you settle here, I'll make it even more dramatic, and you become ultimately perhaps a citizen of that state. That's the normal way we think um, about migration. Think about the metaphors we use here. We describe migrants as uprooted, right? pulled up from here, and transplanted in, their, in, in, in the state, that, the destination state. And it's, that's a particularly powerful metaphor because it links migration with integration, putting down roots in the new state. And because it suggests cutting ties with the home states because plants don't have roots in two different places. Um, what I want to argue, though, is that the vast uh, majority of people who cross international borders do not uproot themselves and settle in a state of destination. Now, this is, of course, true for the hundreds of millions of visitors, tourists, and students around the world. But it's also true for large numbers of persons who seek work in another state and move or would move recurrently from their home state to places where they can be gainfully employed. And this is sometimes referred to as circular migration. So people live here, they go here to work for time, and then they come back. These are large numbers of people uh, around the world. Secondly, people may seek to maintain homes and communities in two places. 
They may move, but they don't view themselves as giving up uh, their home their, their home and their home state, even if they do put down roots uh, in, this, in this other state. This is the view of the transnationalism literature in sociology and anthropology. And, and while scholars have noted that transnationalism is not a new phenomenon, most agree that its scope and depth has increased in recent years. This means that people move here, the people who move here need not be pulling up roots there. Rather than the straight line assumption of migration, uh, it, it substitutes for that a, a conception of simultaneity. So I'm suggesting that we, en we amend our usual triadic descriptions of migration of sort of lawful permanent residence and then there's temporary migration and then over here is what I'll call undocumented migration. That's the, those are the categories we usually have. And we include somewhere here, I don't know if it's another point or somewhere in the middle, um, this movement in the middle, which is something more than tourism, but something less than settlement, uh, and also includes dual local residences. Now, importantly, most of this movement is actually state-supported and facilitated. Of course, it's true of guest worker programs, but beyond that, um, more important both in terms of movers, uh, in the numbers of movers and dual settlement, I'm sorry, but both in, um, but more important, both in terms of numbers and movers and dual settlement, uh, are other kinds of state policies. And here I'm thinking about work that Reiner Bobek did a, a number of years ago uh, in talking about the rise of regional zones of free movements among states in Europe, Latin America, and probably next uh, in Africa. And I think about this in terms of the EU. Um, the EU has, what, 500 million uh, citizens of the EU, about that, who have freedom of movement to settle in any of the countries uh, they wish. Uh, and tens of millions of people around the world now possess a dual citizenship. Compare that to the total number of migrants counted by the UN, 250 million people living outside their country uh, for more than uh, one year. My guess is that this group in the middle, either having two homes or a home that they leave and go back to, leave and go back to, probably far exceeds uh, the number of people who actually migrate under st uh, straight, straight uh, line migration as I've described it. Now, the legal changes of, of uh, free movement zones and of dual nationality overcome significant barriers of the need for visas or for fitting into quotas or categories and other rules regulating migration. And as I say, I think, and I, here I agree with Reiner, uh, that they're the major cause for the increase uh, in mobility um, around the world. All right, so that's one way in which I think a decentered approach to migration this thinking about this other kinds of movement that nom normally is not counted uh, would change our lens. And I should say on this, I'm looking at Hiroshi Motomura, who's in the audience here. He and I have been a co-author of a case book on immigration law in the U.S. for United States, in the U.S. Uh, for many, many years uh, together. That book is about a th up to a thousand pages now, Hiroshi, almost? 1,500 pages, okay. In that book, it's almost entirely devoted to what we would call green card movement, people coming to the United States for settlement in the US and then citizenship. And a usually untaught, difficult chapter relates to all the temporary kinds of visas. But there's nothing on this kind of circular uh, kind of movement and a little bit uh, on, on dual nationality. And this is typical of our field, is this over-focus on this kind of straight line uh, migration. Okay, the second way, way in which a decentered state perspective can influence scholarly analysis is to open up conceptualizations of movement as occurring within fields or zones constructed by the migrants themselves that don't map onto our normal uh, sense of this first line, that, as I said, there's a state here, there's a state here, and then people move among it. This state approach is, uh, is known in the anthropological literature as methodological nationalism that we tend to approach migration and most other studies from the field we're located in and we, from the literal field, and that field is identified with the state. That's what I'm arguing um, against here, that we think about this in other ways. To many movers, whether they're tourists or settlers or something in between, state borders don't define their special geographical understanding of their world. 
that's not to say state borders aren't real, and of course they influence the forms of movement, the expense, and the frequency of movement, but they're more seen as obstacles in a field defined in other spatial terms. I think of them from this perspective like mountains or rivers that cross these fields of mobility. So from a state-centered perspective, movement across borders tends to be seen as the act of an individual seeking to improve his or her life by entering into another polity. But imagine instead zones of movement constructed by members of communities. And those who move usually do so within established networks and channels following routes and seeking destinations established by others before them. So this might look more like, if we have these recurrent movers, this might be their zone of migration, their zone of mobility. That's how they may see the world that they live in as they establish two homes or move recurrently. And again, these state borders have an influence on that movement, but that's not how they conceptualize um, their world um, of mobility. So Mexican migration in the United States is an obvious and vivid example of this massive movement from migration to the U.S. has been going on for more than a century. And in doing so, it's established not settlers, not people who came, got green cards and citizenship, although many Mexicans do, but to me it's established much more uh, complex and a deep social field of movement and transnational communities. Now, state policies have played a role in that. I'm not, that's why I'm saying I'm not, I'm not, this approach is not state absent, it's state decentered. So in a recent book entitled Undocumented Lives, Anna Raquel Minion uh, describes Mexican policies in the 20th century that tried to offload a, what was viewed as a surplus Mexican population in the United States and how the American policies initially welcomed people, then unwelcomed people, and then criminalized undocumented movement. So the state policy is varied, and that's obviously affected the movement of people. Um, but the migrants uh, that I, as I see, the, I'm sorry, th those state policies must be understood alongside the worlds created by migrants and their communities. And the migrants are not simply illegal, nor I don't think they should be championed as valiantly undermining oppressive state borders, as is sometimes also uh, portrayed in the literature. Rather, I see them as exercising a constrained mobility of their own making for their own purposes, establishing ways of living that probably should not be categorized as post-national or deterritorialized, but that surely do not fit the state-centered model of migration as state-to-state -state resettlement. So I want to designate these two elements, movement other than immigration as settlement, and movement within defined but not state-defined fields as part of a study of human mobility. There, there are many other elements. I just want to focus on these two today. And I, I'm not trying to load too much into this term mobility. Mobility is a, uh, is a part of current fashion now in the social sciences. There are several journals developed uh, that have been uh, created in the last uh, decade or so on human mobility. Um, I don't want to get into a, meth a, a, a terminological debate here, but I'm using the term to contrast it with migration, which I'm thinking of in this straight line movement and resettlement of people. Mobility captures these other forms of movement, these other uh, fields of movement. Now, as I've said, crit critical anthropologists and sociologists have focused on mobility for some time, and they attack what they see as sedentarism, uh, sedentarism, uh, and as I've said, methodological nationalism in much, much of the existing literature. Let me just quote a, a very recent paper by, by Nicholas to Geneva, uh, who puts it this way, the sheer force and vitality of migrant mobilities is remaking space at every scale, from the most localized sense of neighborhood to the global scale of complex transnational regions and transcontinental meta-regions configured by migrant trajectories and the new ensembles of so, uh, social relations. Uh, that migrants sustain. I'll quote one more sentence. He goes on to say, as autonomous subjects with their own aspirations, needs, and desires which necessarily exceed and overflow any regime of immigration and citizenship, migrants' mobility projects enact an elementary freedom of movement to which borders are intrinsically a response, however brutal. Now, 
I think I may be a bit more of a sedentarist than the critical scholars here. As I've said from the start, I see the state uh, uh, having a, a very important role in basically keeping people home, not out of force, but out of cultural uh, production uh, and, and a sense uh, of belonging. But I certainly share with DeGeneva and others writing in this vein their recognition of non-state transnational forms of community established by the movement of the migrants themselves. Now, a focus on mobility of, uh, uh, of people has a number of interesting implications. I'll just say a brief word about a couple of this and then, how am I doing on time here? That's how much I've used or how much I've left? Never. Yikes. Okay, I'll be very brief on this part then. I'm thinking here about undocumented migration or unauthorized ma migration. You know, if we shift the frame of reference to see movement with a, in a zone not defined by borders, then the terms legal and illegal become problematic. People simply move within the zone uh, that they have created, as do citizens within state borders move freely. Um, the border legalities will throw up obstacles to movement, as I've said, but it doesn't alter the perceptions of the movers as to existence of the zone and the legitimacy of movement within it. Indeed, such movement will appear as natural to movers, as does movement of citizens within states. And the reasons they move will appear entirely reasonable. They're moving to, for work, they're moving back to family, they're bringing kids with them, they're, bringing, they're taking kids home for school uh, and the like. Um, and uh, one other implication, um, another implication regards proposals to legalize undocumented migrants. From, from the state-centered views, these are problematic because people who bridge state sovereignty are now asking for a benefit to be put on a path to citizenship. But if I'm correct that many people seek mobility within zones of movement defined in ways not coterminous with states, and that even if they move recurrently, they don't necessarily seek permanent settlement in the destination states, then legalization programs may largely assist this kind of circular movement, right? One of the implications in the US of increasing border patrol is that it is locked in an undocumented population that used to move freely back and forth. So rather than legalization being you know, sovereignty surrendering to undocumented migration, it may actually facilitate this kind of circular movement if you have a green card and, and come, come, uh, come back, and, uh, back and forth. Okay, let me turn now to refugee mobility in my uh, remaining time. So, I'm suggesting this theory should take account of increasing and other forms of mobility of migrants, but at the same time we have to come to grips with a large category of deeply and forgotten immobile people, and this is refugees. And again, not the general way we think about refugees who we view as in motion, right? Forced from their, uh, forced from their homes and then trying desperately to get across various places. I once dealt with some filmmakers who wanted to do a, a series on, on refugees and they, and they wanted to call it Worlds in Motion. And I said, no, the refugee story is Worlds Not in Motion. It's actually about immobility. Let me say that. The, the experience of most forced migrants today can broadly be described as forced, coerced displacement followed by constrained movement. The initial movement of refugees is forced, not voluntary, but once they've achieved safety, almost always in a neighboring state, bordering their home state, they become largely immobile. If the hosting state has a policy of encampment, as does Kenya, then refugees may be denied the freedom of movement within the state, which is a violation of rights guaranteed by the Refugee Convention. Beyond that, opportunities for moving beyond the country of first asylum uh, to other countries are generally very, very limited. Only a small number of refugees each year are granted resettlement slots. It may be 100,000 tops, 150,000 people who resettle each year out of a population of 20 million refugees worldwide. And if you kind of think about the, 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 uh, the number of children born to refugees every year in, uh, in states of first asylum, that will far exceed the number of people who are actually resettled uh, elsewhere. Uh, so if people want to move outside resettlement, they're now categorized as illegal, um, illegal immigrants. Now, in the earliest days of the refugee regime, movement was understood as a crucial part of helping refugees rebuild their lives. And a central um, innovation of the post-World War I 
efforts to extend protection to refugees, something called the Nansen Passport. We tend to think of uh, the refugee regime beginning after World War II. It actually begins after World War I with the appointment of a High Commissioner for Refugees. Fridtjof Nansen was the first High Commissioner. He had been a polar explorer, Norwegian diplomat, who then became the first High Commissioner. And he noticed that most refugees had no documentation. They'd been forced out of these crumbling empires, the Russian Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they were in other states without identification. And he gave them a piece of paper that gave them identification. And he, it became known as the Nansen Passport. And what the Nansen Passport did is it, it, it didn't guarantee you entry to another state, but it meant that if you wanted to go to another state, the other state would see who you were, could identify you. And importantly, it did give you a right to return to the state of first asylum because otherwise states would say, hey, once you're a refugee and you're gone, you're not coming back in. So it did facilitate this kind of movement and create um, identification. And the movement of refugees with the Nansen passport was seen as crucial to help refugees rebuild their lives because there weren't the kind of massive assistance programs we now have for displaced people around the world after World War I. So people were supposed to take care of themselves and moving became part of that ability to find employment to take care of one's family. Um, but this sensible idea of providing opportunities for refugees to move no longer figures in the refugee regime. Refugees are really given one shot at safety and security. Humanitarianism has focused on securing protection and assistance in that country of first asylum, not in facilitating movement beyond that. Think about how this played out in the refugee uh, situation from Syria, uh, from Syria to Turkey. Three million Syrian refugees uh, now live in Turkey. Um, those who were accepted into European states before the walls were put in place were placed into the asylum process where they had to apply all over again for refugee status. But most were met with border police, fences, other barriers, were denied entry. They were simply deemed illegal migrants. And then eventually, as you all know, the European Council um, attempted to distribute a Syrian asylum seekers, which fell apart because members of the EU, certain members of the EU refused to uh, accept it, and eventually the EU and Turkey uh, accepted a deal where uh, uh, Syrian asylum seekers would be returned to Turkey in exchange for a promise of 6 billion euros, progress towards uh, visa-free travel for Turks in the EU, and a restart of the process that might eventuate in Turkey's admission to the EU, of course, which has not really come to pass, of course, and the talks really have not uh, restarted. So we had this weird world where EU politicians, journalists, NGOs, and other humanitarian actors had no difficulty traveling from Europe to Turkey to cover the refugee crisis, so-called. But the refugees themselves faced formidable legal and practical barriers in moving from Turkey to the EU. Freedom of movement, it seems, is a privilege of the most fortunate, not the most in need. Now, there is lots that needs fixing in our international refugee regime. There needs to be more assistance for hosting states and refugees. There needs to be enforcement of refugee rights, like the right to work. There needs to be the establishment of a, of a global responsibility and sherry system that we do not have uh, in place. And, and there are some reforms that are now being put in place, particularly the, the bringing of the development actors into what would have been thought of as a humanitarian sphere. So the development dollars are going into hosting states to uh, help out the hosting communities and also perhaps provide uh, economic uh, benefits to refugees uh, as well. But this putting development into the hosting states, although it may well hope to st help the states and the refugees, is really, to my mind, just another part of the emplacement of immobility on refugees. The motivation is to keep refugees there. If they can be taken care of there better, they won't come here. Now, I think states have a responsibility by being members of an international regime on refugee protection uh, to help share the burden uh, with other states. And I th what, I'm what, I'm, what I'm thinking about here is that mobility may well be the key to enhancing responsibility sharing. UNHCR has talked about more resettlement and other legal pathways for people to move. But I want to suggest something more. Again, if we decenter states and imagine a zone of movement not defined by state borders, Turkey, Greece, Germany, 
but rather defined by the boundaries of an international system created by a union of states that have signed on to the convention and helped create and fund UNHCR. The idea would be that refugees would be recognized as having the right of free movement between and among the members of the regime. Just as EU citizens can move to any EU state, refugees would be given the right to move to any country that has joined into this regime, which most of the countries of the world have done. Essentially, this is a suggestion for the revival of the Nansen passport and endowing it with an additional element of presumptively authorizing entry of refugees to other state members of the international system of refugee protection. Under this scheme, persons arriving in the next country would not be asylum seekers. The Syrians who got to Germany wouldn't have to go through another individualized determination. They would have been recognized as refugees and travel as refugees as people with Nansen passports were able to do. Now, obviously, to be acceptable to member states, not all the people can go to one state. You may want some kind of distribution uh, strategy so that, in fact, there is a, a sharing of the burden. But the central principle here would be one of respecting, supporting refugee agency as they attempt to rebuild their lives. Now, I think it's obvious that this kind of system of mobility would benefit all parties. Refugees are able to regain agency and advance the goal of self-reliance. Hosting states are benefited because some refugees will be moving out if they can't, can't find work in the hosting state. States of destination gain from having refugees who are linked to employers who seek their labor. Um, and the, uh, this kind of mobility would undercut the need for smuggling and trafficking. It would surely decrease exploitation and prevent deaths at sea. And it would, it would cut the need for humanitarian assistance to many people who are now able to take uh, care of themselves. Now, I'm not so naive to think that this systemic mobility can be adopted immediately. I get it. Um, there'd be a strong opposition from third countries who would believe they would receive too many. And we've seen, as I've said, the walls to go up. So I think one way to start this process would be to think about regional uh, free movement systems. So the EGAD countries in, 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 um, in East Africa uh, have put together a plan on Somali refugees that could allow movement between uh, Kenya and Uganda and Ethiopia and Djibouti. Similar efforts are at work now in Latin America with some of the Central American refugees. So that, that's where I would start it and hopefully through the growth and the recognition this kind of free movement within zones could then maybe build into a general right of mobility. So I'm getting close to my conclusion here. Okay. Let me talk about the global compacts on migration uh, and, mobile, and, and uh, refugees as a way of um, uh, making some concluding remarks. So I've been talking about mobility for migrants and mo mobility for refugees, and I'm doing it at the same time that the UN is negotiating two global compacts, which were called for by the General Assembly in 2016. There's a global compact on, mig on migration, being co-facilitated by Switzerland and Mexico, and there's a, a global compact on refugees, uh, which is being written by UNHCR. Both should be adopted late uh, this year, actually, by the General Assembly. Now, what a great place to be able to put mobility on the table, right, in both these compacts, uh, to work it into our vocabulary, our policy models, our scholarly models. But nothing in the first drafts of these compacts moves us in this direction. The, Global Compact on Refugees seeks to enhance global responsibility sharing, but not through any kind of allocation system. It does call for the creation of some kind of global platform, uh, and I think that would be a step in the right direction, but does not pick up on the idea of uh, additional mobility uh, for refugees. The Global Compact on Migration promises very little new. In fact, the co-facilitators say it creates no new norms, it's not binding, and it creates no new institutions. You almost wonder why people are going through uh, the process. Rather, Mexico and Switzerland co-facilitators say it creates a, uh, a, an international ecosystem for addressing migration. And that is a step, because just as we've had a refugee regime since the 1950s, we don't have a similar kind of regime uh, for the movement of migration at the international um, level. And current drafts commit states to honoring human rights of migrants, to cooperating on labor migration, and trafficking and smuggling and border management, and I won't go through the list, there are 22 different, literally 22 goals that are identified in the compact. But there's not a hint in this document that mobility should be enhanced, or even that it's a good thing for the world. Uh, 
Rather, the, the global compact on migration essentially takes the stance that migration is a phenomenon that needs to be managed. Uh, and in fact, the major concern of the European states, almost the only concern of the European states, is that the compact recognize a duty of other states to accept back their nationals when EU states want, when European states want to deport them. I think it's not unfair to say that the central theme of both compacts is that human beings should stay where they are. And this is said in the Global Compact of Migration. The goal is, quote, to minimize the adverse drivers and structural factors that compel people to leave their country of origin. Not a bad goal. I'm not against that. But that can't be the only goal of, uh, of a compact on migration. And it should be pretty clear this is not very close to the, uh, to the approaches that I've been advocating for today. I think the compacts adopt this old-fashioned straight-line analysis. What they see is there are large numbers of people seeking to move from the global south to the global north, even though south-south migration is the same as south-north migration. That movement must be managed, and if controls produce leakage through illegal immigration, then they simply have to tighten the screws to make sure there's no illegal immigration. They recognize that, yes, along the way, migrants are entitled to human rights, but one such human right is not a right to mobility itself. Circular migration, recurrent migration, could be featured as a win-win. Mobility for refugees could be seen as a novel and significant route to responsibility sharing. New forms of membership could be explored rather than accepting the view that everyone in the global south seeks citizenship in the global north. But none of this appears. We continue to live in a world of migration, not a world of mobility. And here I promise is my conclusion. I have, I have one more minute. So by way of conclusion, I want to put this paper in a broader context and return to the normative. I've talked about the immobility that refugees face, but I've not said much about another group of the, immo of the immobile. These are people whose attempts at movement to another state are repelled by guards, by guns, and by jails. And even if there were a world of fully open borders, there would be many people who might desire to move who can't move because they lack the resources to afford travel and, the settle and settlement or the skills necessary to build a life elsewhere. I think the most significant contribution that a theory of mobility could make would be to make clear that if we start from the lives of human beings, it would make clear just how unjust our current system of immigration regulation is. Most of those who seek to move do so, seek to move for reasons of work and economic benefit. And the data is clear from the economists that if you were to have a world without borders, the global GDP would go up by trillions of dollars. But the people who now want to move and are prevented from moving do so within a global context of unconscionable and tragic inequality of wealth, opportunity, and power, a state of affairs in which the states to which they seek entry have either contributed or benefited from or both. The legacies of colonialism, of military adventurism, of mineral extraction, and other forms of interstate domination poured the foundation on which global economic policies and military alliances are now maintaining the structure and superstructure of global inequality. In such a world, it seems to me, mobility is a small but real step towards reducing inequalities. Now, it's very interesting that in the Sustainable Development Goals adopted several years ago by the, by the UN, the migration guys were pushing to have something mentioned about migration uh, in, in the Sustainable Development Goals, which are all about uh, human, human development, advancing human development in very broad terms. And what they got, there were 16 goals and there, there were targets under each goal. And so target 10.7 is the migration target in the SDGs under goal seven. It ended up being stated in old fashioned straight line migration ways. So the target is to states should commit to facilitating orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people, including through the implementation of planned and well-managed migration policies. Okay, that's the the old kind of language, we need well-managed migration, not that, not that mobility is a good thing for the world. But interestingly, the place this was put in the SDGs was under goal number 10. And goal number 10 is about reducing inequality with and, um, in, within and among countries. How it got there, I'm not quite certain, but I find that hopeful. 
And it's here that I want to ground a right to mobility, not in common ownership of the earth or the instrumental or expressive value of free movement, but rather the contribution that mobility can make toward a more equal and a more just world. Thank you.